All right, guys, you are listening to the Road Trip Podcast, and today I have one of my favorite nutrition authors. Um, he wrote a brilliant book called The Warrior Diet, and I believe it came out in early 2000s, but I, I actually ended up reading it, I think, four or five years ago, and that was my first real start and experience with intermittent fasting, which really just actually had so many benefits for me. I, I, I could go on and on, and so uh, I'm really excited to have Ori on the podcast, Ori Hoffmeckler. Um, and we're going to be taking a look at, at really uh, the power of intermittent fasting, you know, the advantage of eating more food at night and uh, you know, keeping that sim sympathetic nervous system activated during the day. Um, and we're also going to get into some new stuff that he's been talking about and, and working on. Um, and let's get to it. Ori, how are you today? Very good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm quite well. So. Um, there was actually something you wanted to talk about, which is, is which is kind of very fresh. You haven't really um, talked too much about it before, and that's stress-activated food. Um, and so while it's fresh, let's talk a little bit about, about that and, and, and why you um, find that to be effective. This is actually one of the most fascinating concepts that I've been aware of for quite a while, but only recently a science is doing now giant steps ahead toward understanding this phenomena of nature. The phenomena is called hormesis. I don't know if you are aware of this, but hormesis, oxenohormesis, is the ability, biologic, uh, the ability of organism to deliver stress resistant signal. Xenohormesis means one organism can incredibly deliver stress resistance signal to another organism. But in order for that to happen, organisms need to be under stress. We were told to believe that stress is bad for us. Stress is detrimental actually to our health. But life and biology shows the opposite, that it's actually the lack of stress that shorter the health span and lifespan of organism. It is the lack of stress. That's why when you are active, you're in a better shape. You should be on a better health. You should have a leaner body and healthier body. We'll talk soon about how important it is to be lean, actually. But stress is not just beneficial, I would say is essential to life. And the ability to resist stress is evolutionary concept over two and a half billion years way before human, perhaps even mammal, came about. This is how important it is. Two and a half billion years ago, there's already evidence of presence of certain kind of stress response compound, certain kind of protein that allow your body to resist stress, resist disease, and even resist aging. It's an incredible phenomenon. But now we need to ask, what does it mean stress activated food and how would, do we benefit from it? And even more important is the question, what would happen to your body if you do not receive them. So let's come back to the concept of stress. The whole idea of warrior diet and intermittent, when I came with the idea of intermittent fasting in practice, just before the year 2000, the whole idea was to put people under nutritional stress, but not chronic stress, mm -hmm. intermittent stress. Chronic stress, like anything chronic, destroys you. Chronic starvation, chronic exercise, chronic fasting will degrade you and perhaps will kill you. We are very, very well developed or programmed to resist intermittent stress. In fact, we thrive under that. So the whole idea of intermittent fasting, such as with the warrior diet, was to put human on a feeding cycle that they evolved to. So we can definitely discuss the advantage of it and you probably experienced, but what has been missing all this time 
is the stress activated food link that is a missing link in our diet so let's start we evolved in a very stress world we actually evolved to thrive under stress in a stress world where food was scarce and the food itself was grown under stress condition and we the food that we evolved to produce compound xenohomeric compound that help us resist stress resist disease and in fact live much longer than conventional thinking is believe it's possible why people died earlier in the past mostly from accident they die like young people do from accidents infection predation cold shock heat shock simply too much stress however those who survive potentially could live very long with this in mind we had nutrients that allow us allow our metabolism to get the same benefit of diet and exercise even without dieting and exercise the problem is that this nutrient Greg is not part of the modern human food chain mm -hmm. they usually exist in parts of food that we don't eat anymore box rhizome peats and peels plants contain the most profound stress response Animals do. It usually concentrate in milk, such as from stress grass-fed animals. And I can come to more details, but most of the stress response compound that mimic the effect of exercise and fasting on the body, and they even have profound anti-cancerous properties. Appeals in plants part that we don't eat so I'm excited with this because we already presented a lot of science behind and my company defense nutrition is actually dedicated to bring back this nutrient which are missing in our diet so whether you follow intermittent fasting or not this science is profound this nutrient will benefit you even if you don't diet and exercise however if you do diet and exercise they would quadruple, in my opinion, the benefit that you get. I do believe, and I know it sounds crazy, that people have the capacity not only to double the lifespan, but keep themselves biologically young in a lean, healthy, and potent body for the prolonged life that they can reach. <clears throat> wow. Wow, so um, that's that's very interesting because this whole concept of stress-activated food is something that I haven't heard before, and probably most people have not heard before because you're, it seems like you're at the the forefront of it. Um, and it's cool how it goes hand in hand with fasting and exercise. And I like what you're talking about as far as you know, stress is a good thing as long as it's not chronic because exercise is inherently stressful. Um, Fasting is a brief period of stress, um, but then when that stress is elongated, which usually is the, this is what most people have actually, if you think about it, most people in, in today's society, they're holding on to some form of stress 24-7. It's not intense physical stress like running from a tiger or a bear, right. it's just, you know, it's like that psychological stress that they're buried with all the time, something that's just at the back of their head, it's just causing that low level of cortisol just to be flooding through the body and so um, it's a very intriguing subject Craig what you say is very true so allow me to be a little bit cruel from objective biological point of view yeah stress, stress bring a very paradoxical concept yes it can kill species but it also improve the gene pool it also make you today in many ways potentially superior to your ancestors. How come you ask me? No, ancestors were much better shaped than we are, blah, blah. Not necessarily. That would make us different the way that from the paleo diet. We really don't believe 
that people today are inferior, genetically inferior to our ancestors. In fact, in many ways we carry genes that allow us to survive certain kind of hardship that our ancestors do not. But let's come back to stress. What stress does, it enforces the survival of the fittest rule of nature. Natural selection should take place in all species. So those who do not fit, do not survive. And those who were fit, survive and, and, and deliver their genes to perhaps offspring with better chance to survive. And this rule of nature, of natural selection, apply to all species. So when you take a species off the stress, it starts to degrade. If it's chronically unstressed, it will degrade. Let me give you an example, for instance. The domesticated turkey is an unstressed species. Its lifespan is virtually a few months. Even if the president pardoned the turkey, excuse me, the turkey will die. However, wild-type turkey can live four to seven years, hey, four months versus four years is a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the same rule applies to the domesticated pig and the wild hog. And humans are not exception. If we, as a species, if you as an individual live an unstressed, physically unstressed, nutritional unstressed lifestyle, you are prone to prematurely age, gain on excess weight and prematurely young die okay so so then to for people to really grasp this concept what are the markers in place in which stress um, you know has those health benefits or triggers positive adaptations or life extension so if you're doing exercise or you're doing fat like why do we require this stress in order That's a great to... question. That's a great question, Craig. I think it's coming to the bottom line because there is amazing science behind stress, and usually people don't understand what exactly happened during exercise. Well, exercise is a catabolic process. That, by all means, if you look objectively, it's break tissues, it increases cortisol, it inhibits mTOR the mechanism to actually build your tissue, it's inhibited, okay? It boosts your adrenal and it puts your body in a mode of stress response. Now your body to compensate produce certain kind of compound. It's called stress proteins, like heat shock protein. Their job is to prevent your tissues and your cells from unfolding and total damage. And while doing that, there is a total process that takes place in your body. If you exercise, when you exercise, you activate, first of all, certain kind of pathway. It's called a longevity pathway. It's called AMP kinase. It's a certain kind of enzyme pathway that shift your body immediately into fat burning rather than carbohydrate. It, it uh, enhances glucose utilization in the muscle. It inhibits fat gain, fat synthesis. It inhibits cholesterol synthesis. It puts your body in a very positive survival mode and a better ability to resist stress. AMP kinase is a key pathway. There are other pathways. There is a pathway like sirtuin, uh, and our F2 that I actually activate by certain kind of nutrients. And they walk all together to the same direction. There's another process that happens to your body, especially when you fast an extra. It's called autophagocytosis. The body is forced to search and destroy every negative element in your body, Craig. Broken derbies in the cell are being recycled, broken protein. There's a cellular repair and cleansing that happen that would otherwise would not happen. 
As a result, tissues are rejuvenated. Your body not just triggered insulin sensitivity increases, and your body is getting into a repair mode. After exercise, this repair mode is what build your muscle. So the mechanism, interesting, and the genes that exercise trigger are virtually the same as fasting and virtually the same as stress activated nutrient. They walk to the same direction. They allow your body to be in a repair survival mode, something that most people do not reach at all. Those who exercise reach it more or less on the duration of the exercise. So AMP kinase is activated and enhanced during the duration of exercise, but as you have your recovery meal, if you do, if you do it with a typical carbohydrate, you shut it down. So most people have it for a very limited time. If you intermittent fast and exercise and you take soft stress activated food nutrient, this repair molecule, this stress response molecule, percolate in your body for hours and hours, day by day. So it's not just keep you lean, healthy, more potent and viable. It actually keep you young for many, many, many years. So right now you are very young, at least you look very young, okay? <laughs> Let's see you 50 years from now. Can you still kick ass? Can you still be adventurous and entrepreneurial as you are now? Can you still like the challenge? I'm sure you will if you do it right. Cool, yeah, you know what? Um, that's my plan. I don't want to end up being like, what's the point of living if you're frail, you can't move, and you have no sexual drive? Um, that doesn't sound too fun for me. Um, but but let's we we just you mentioned how if you were to consume carbohydrates after exercise, you are in essence um, blocking this stress stress activated response. Yes. And that's and that does that have to do with the insulin increase or um, uh, how does that what what's the issue with having carbohydrates um, after exercise? Very very good question, and I so many people ask me this question. Look, Craig, you've got to make a choice. If you your goal is mainly to build muscle and gain maximum performance, then carbohydrates after exercise is the right thing to do. If your health or anti-aging is coming secondary and just you want to have maximum performance, carbohydrates after exercise will be great. They will move back to replenish your empty glycogen that will um, spike insulin, which is a very anabolic hormone. Uh, all, all, all the theories of old Joe Wider were right in this perspective. However, there's another way to look at life, and the way is called delay, delay growth. Do we really need to grow right after exercise, or can the body compensate later on during the day, and maybe even trigger super compensation mechanism use that you can still build muscle, but not right after exercise by the end of the day? This is a key question, because if I prove you that you can build muscle and even muscle by the end of the day and keep the fat burning circulation hormone percolating in your body until the end of the day, okay, and keep your stress response benefit you and recycle your tissue and rejuvenate and improve your muscle fiber quality until the end of the day, then what would you choose? Yeah, definitely to save it for the end later in the day. Yeah, because there's something that is missing also. I was supposed to talk about nutrition. Let's talk a minute about fitness. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about building muscle. But building muscle in biology is a secondary trait. Humans were never that big. But we were smart. And we developed 
special body with larger variety of muscle fiber to allow us very delicate task that fits our brain capacity. For example, you can type, you can write music. If you ask a gorilla to do that or a chimpanzee, it will break the computer. He doesn't have this delicate, slow muscle fiber that allow him to do delicate more. Everything is rough and robust. They are equivalent of the type B or type 2A fast muscle. They don't have the small one. There is a reason why we evolved this way. And we need to understand our nature. We cannot live like other people. We are not gorilla. We are not chimpanzees. We are not elephants. We are not bears. We are humans. So we evolved to be that way. So in biological fitness, the size of your muscle is only one factor. The most important factor is the quality of muscle fiber. So what does it mean, quality of muscle fiber? Well, the body has an ability to transfer one muscle fiber, transform one muscle fiber to another. There is something which is called the super muscle fiber. It's actually a fast fiber, type 2AX. Why is it super and why it is super quality? Because you have unmatched ability to utilize both carbohydrate and fat fuel. The ability to use fat and carbohydrate fuel is a huge advantage, a huge evolutionary advantage. Not that it should allow you fast performance, it allows you great durability, hence fat fuel. And if you look at the research, your body ability to burn fat, to utilize fat as a primary fuel, is a key for your health, is a key for your longevity. If you are developing primarily type 2B fast glycolytic muscle that are only carb dependent, you are prone for obesity and diabetes, period. There's not even an argument about it. If, however, you develop a body with better muscle fiber quality, beside the slow, the fast 2A at 2AX, your fat burning is primal. Your body will percolate and burn fat even when you don't exercise and you become beside fast and competent, you can become very durable. So there was an evolutionary advantage for the human species to carry type 2A X fibers. And we need to respect that. Now, how do we develop this fiber? We develop it by intense exercise that combine strength, speed, and durability, but we also force the body to shift to fat burning as a primary fuel. So that somehow fit your territory of losing weight, getting lean, because yes, there was evolutionary advantage of human to be lean and to be able to burn fat and stay lean. Huge evolutionary advantage. So here's how it all come to place. Quality muscle fiber, not so much the size, the quality that inherently build to burn fat. Ability to sustain a lean body, because as you probably know, lean body and weight loss also trigger survival gene. Every time you lose, and um, you probably talked about it before because I don't want to get too complicated, but obesity, is known as a state of inflammation. It's an inflammatory disease. Obesity is also caused by inflammatory hormone or cytokines. So as your body get this signal, inflammatory signal, two things are happening. You become insulin insensitivity, insensitive, and you gain fat. And as you lose weight, things start to fix themselves. Your body produces anti-inflammatory cytokines. Some of them actually, like adiponectin coming from the fat cell themselves, make you lean. Now let's go back to the initial question. Why not carbohydrates after exercise? Because carbohydrates spike your insulin. And the more you spike your insulin, the less insulin sensitive you become. Maybe not immediately, 
because exercise helps you increase insulin. But over time, in fact, carb loading is the worst thing you can do for yourself. Yes, it will boost your performance. Carb loading will boost the performance of a bodybuilder, power lifter, and a long distance runner. But on the long term, it will aid you. It will take away your insulin. Every recent research about longevity, about Centurion show that the one undistributable feature of Centurion is high insulin, uh, uh, people who live over 100 years, is high insulin sensitivity. That okay. means the less they use the insulin, the longer they live, and the same whole truth for you. Why would you shutter all these benefits of longevity and health by using high carbohydrate meal, especially after exercise? Why would you jeopardize the benefit of exercise? But this kind of recuperation, there are better way to recuperate. I'll be happy to discuss that. Yeah, so, so you're not saying don't eat carbohydrates. You're just saying don't feed on carbohydrates several times a day. So, Correct. It, so, so yeah, so if somebody's working out at noon and let's say maybe they fasted um, in the morning, they had their first meal at noon, keep that meal mostly protein and fat and then instead have most of your carbs at night in like a window. That's another question. Yes, you are very close. I wouldn't go too far with the fat right after exercise in the midday. Right. Uh, and we need to understand what kind of fat is also important. Um, for example, unsaturated fat increase your capacity to initiate stress response. I don't know if you're aware of that. No. And that's one of the reasons unsaturated fat increase membrane fluidity, especially in the brain. It also gives you a better sense of well-being. Anything that increases your brain fluidity, increase your stress response, give you a sense of pleasure. It's a very interesting phenomenon by itself. Saturated fat may do the opposite, and depends where it's coming from. So that's a subject that we definitely should discuss maybe sometime. But I believe that during the day, your meal should be yes, high protein and high in soft nutrient. That means stress fruits like wild type berries, vegetables or juices will serve you very well. And in fact, it will enhance the effect of the intermittent fasting. And after exercise, your body, your muscle is starving for good protein. You can give it to him. I really think that both way of intermittent fasting, both water fasting, and the way that I just described, quality protein from stress grass-fed animals, a fast assimilating wild fruit type foods and vegetables are perfect. There are certain kind of herbs, all of them are soft, thyme, oregano, parsley, cilantro, um, extremely important extremely, extremely important. Um, but there's one compound or a few compounds. Not all soft mimic the effect of exercise on the body, but few of them do. These are the ones that we selected. One of them is very interesting. It's called berberine. It's an active compound that usually found in golden seal. However, in golden seal it does not appear in the high high enough consultation to do the impact. Berberine is a stress response. It's, it's so potent that I would say it is almost as effective as exercise itself. Um, there is massive research behind what it does and this is only the beginning. It does. People use it in the past for against infection. Most Self nutrients are anti infectional, the antifungal, antimicrobial. However, berberine does exactly what exercise does activate AMP kinase, inhibit mTOR, shift the body into fat burning. Actually, 
accelerate weight loss and inhibit the mechanism that build cancer, hence mTOR. Where mTOR is overactivated, there's a cancer can occur. Basically, it's an opening for cancer. So one of the two, either the cell goes through a process which is called senescence, it's becoming old, cannot replicate, or it can become cancerous. Um, Berberine prohibits these processes from happening. So there are a few uh, stress response compounds that we can basically get from our food. Maybe we don't get it enough, but some of them that we need to source. Bringing it back to the diet will do, again, I'll repeat myself, the next step. Maybe we need another 50 years to figure out what it would do to our society, especially for those who decide that they want to live long and in what shape they would be. Wow, so, okay, so berberine is, is, is one of the, is a supplement, correct? Um, well, no, it, it, yes, because you're not gonna go and eat a bark of a tree. <laughs> yeah. By the way, at the ancient human, the early human diet, some say that large percent, up to 30 or even 50 percent, had bark of trees inside. And let me tell you something interesting about self nutrient. Do you have dogs or cats? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What do you have? A dog or a cat? I have both. I have a, a yellow lab and a, and a cat. Oh, nice. What kind of a cat? Um, he's actually part Manx. He's got like no. He's actually a Manx cat. He's got like no tail. Probably a tabby. Yeah. So, dogs and cats are attracted to stuff. I don't know if you ever wonder why the dog and a cat which are carnivores like to eat grass, chew on grass. Why dogs like to chew on barks on the side of the road, on the backyard, on mulch? I mean, we have olive trees, they like even to chew unripe olives and the pits. What are they looking for? Why my dogs which are carnivores like to chew on plants? They're looking for self nutrient. That's exactly what self nutrient are found. It's a two and a half billion years memory which go to wild type species. It is my theory that if a species is too domesticated, he doesn't have the taste for self anymore. He has the taste for domesticated food. What inhibit stress response is sugar white flour, meat, and other processed food. That inhibit homesis, that inhibit the effect of SAF and jeopardize the effect of your exercise and fasting. So the wild type animal will be attracted to that. Now, the question that I'm going to ask is very simple. When you look deep into hormesis, and we are releasing now more blogs and newsletter for people to understand the process, we evolve to live in a world where one species support the other. In fact, mammals, animals, and humans are kind of more selfish. We don't give to the plant whatever the plant can give us. Plants have very profound stress response mechanism because they cannot escape stress. They are there to handle it. So they produce, produce very profound compound. They protect this plant from lack of water, lack of fertilization, heat shock or cold shock. When we eat that, we benefit. The most profound herbs are coming actually from desert plants, wild weeds, etc. Now, if this mutualism between species do not, do not exist, most likely we won't survive on this planet. There are other kind of behavior of mutualism. I don't know, if I saw in a Discovery Channel how, um, how do they call these animals, um, how uh, a wild hog is benefited from um, other animals, who 
climb on him and eat the worms and bugs on his skin. Uh, certain kind of birds are eating bugs out of crocodiles. Um, uh, we have a lot of relationship mutualism. Dogs and humans have, but there's also biological mutualism. But the one rule of nature that we need to understand that the disappearance of one species, the collapse of one species, can affect other species as well, that including humans. It can lead to the collapse of other species. Um, for instance, we already know that we are losing, there is a collapse, colony collapse of the honeybees. People don't fully understand, they think it's pesticides who cause it and stuff. Perhaps, but what research and I believe is that honeybees evolved for wildflowers. The self nutrient that they use, the stress response nutrient that they used to get from the nectar and the pollen are not there anymore. Because of monocropping and agricultural methods and the chemicals that we use, even our wild fields are not as wild anymore. There's over fertilization everywhere. Plants, domesticated and wild, become less and less stressed. They produce less stress response compound. It's called the colony collapse of some species. The disappearance of honeybees will be inevitable if we don't do steps to preserve our wild environment. And as humans, I would like to conclude my part here. We must understand it that our food chain must get this nutrient back. We cannot allow ourselves to live on domesticated food. The overpumped strawberries and cucumbers are useless. The seedlet rape that lost the seed, that's where all the stuff, are useless. The seedless watermelon are useless. If you can, go to the farmer market, you can still find wild type food and encourage the farmers to continue doing that. Um, cows that are fed with grains, beside the fact it's inhumane, I don't even eat meat, I love animals, including cows. Um, these cows who are fed in a feedlot, uh, the milk is this dysfunctional. In comparison, Cows or goats, which are free range and um, need to get their food from whatever they found on the pasture, grass or early legumes, etc., are more nutritional stress, they're more active, they produce milk with profound stress response compound. And I can get, uh, can get it, some of them in the form of immunosupportive protein, some of them in the form of certain kind of B vitamin called niacinamide riboside, which is doing, by the way, amazing stuff regarding fat burning and longevity. There is a profound difference between our food, and I would like to bring this knowledge back. I'd like to bring this nutrient back, so people should be able to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what would be some food examples of stress? activated foods, um, like organic berries, I think you mentioned, um, grass-fed, uh, dairy from grass-fed cows, um, and then and then uh, herbs and stuff of that nature. Are there any other like no, like foods that people could have to, to amplify the stress-activated uh, let, let me put it like this. Any kind of vegetable that grew up, grow up under stress mm -hmm. is contain stress activated nutrient. Some of them are AMP kinase activator like berberine salicin from the willow, but a willow plant, a white willow plant. Um, we get green tea, green tea contain very potent stuff in the form of catechin, epigallocatechin, E, G, C, G. Very potent, they really do everything that I just described. All the wild herb, I mean, I know my wife is growing some wild herb in the garden. We enjoy it like oregano, thyme, uh, rosemary. Uh, oregano, thyme, and rosemary have compounds called carbacrol, 
which is very important. One of the top three, I believe, or top five, I believe, is curcumin from turmeric. Turmeric, extremely, just go into research, it's a classical stress response compound. It's coming from the root. So most roots of wild type plants will provide you stress response compounds. Then go to a father. So when you look at your salad bowl, every vegetable, have it been grown wild, it contains stress response, including compound, including peanuts, wild type peanuts, will contain resveratrol, which is a stress response compound. You know, the best grapes and wine are done from grapes exposed to extreme sun and not over fertilization and not over hydration. Um, these kind of grapes will yield the best wine. It's the stressed strawberry that would be sweeter and better and nutritionally superior. They also have compounds which call stuck, sirtuin activating compounds. Sirtuin is another uh, longevity pathway. Um, go to, let's go jump to the animal kingdom besides stress, uh, beside grass fed cows or goats, the milk and cheese. Um, we have wild catch fish like salmon which goes against the stream. If you really catch it and it's wild catch, it contains stress activated compound. Um, stress enhancing compound, I said before, unsaturated fatty acid. The party also explained the beneficial effect of unsaturated fat, like from olive oil, Omega-3 from uh, plants, actually, flax and hemp on human health. Um, and the list go on. I think that there is a lot of cactus, you know, desert plant. Every time that you find a desert plant that is edible, it will contain stuff. Um, if there are plants grown in Antarctica, they will contain stuff too, okay? Um, we are doing some studies. Uh, we are gonna do some studies soon uh, on stress activated food at the University of Washington. And um, I will update you because um, we are really planning to discover new areas and new compounds that would be extremely potent and beneficial for human health. You know, Craig, in the end of the day, it's not that difficult to understand. We evolved to a world that reward us when we are under stress and we develop the ability to resist stress. Mm -hmm. Up to now, we learn how to do it physically with exercise or avoiding overfeeding. Overfeeding shut down our stress response. And so is lack of exercise. I believe the SAF will be another addition. It would just bring it farther to another level. Right, okay. And berberine is one of like, the keys that you've found to be one of the most powerful um, SAF compounds. Berberine is very powerful SAF compound, but there's another interesting element, so if you bear with me for a minute, I'd like to discuss it quickly. It's, and again, paradoxical. When your stress response is activated, nature rewards you with a great sense of pleasure and well-being. Uh, that's uh, one example is the typical endorphin high that you feel after prolonged intense exercise. In fact, that endorphin high is so powerful that it makes some people actually addicted to physical exercise, which is not a good thing. However, another example and it's very interesting is alcohol. Well, we are told that alcohol is bad for us, but in small amount, like intermittent fasting or small amount, Alcohol, especially from red wine, but not necessarily just red wine, without sugar, will trigger a stress response. And it does it by increased cell membrane fluidization that we talked before. Like unsaturated fat, alcohol increases the membrane fluid fluidization. Your membrane is now vibrate in a different way that allow you to be more sensitive 
to stress, react faster, and initiate it faster. So alcohol helps you initiate stress response and give you an amazing sense of pleasure and well-being. But if you, the intake, again, is a critical factor. If you take it chronically, if you take too much of it, it will cause detrimental effect on your body. Right. You know what? It's funny. I've talked about this before um, where it's like anything really, like if you, if you abuse it, it will take more from you than it can give you. But like alcohol, like as you mentioned, in like the moderation, there's actually a lot of research showing that people that drink mo the alcohol moderately live longer than people that don't drink alcohol. So, I mean, so it's like the dose. You, yeah, anything. And, and so I actually wanted to bring up coffee with you. Um, what are your thoughts on, on coffee? Very good. Uh, thank you for asking. Coffee is a classical stuff. Mm -hmm. All the peats. Every time you find a peach that humans are supposed to consume, it's a sap from apricot, from sour cherry. As kids in Israel, we used to eat peats of apricots mm -hmm. and cherries to crack them. Um, they usually have a bitter taste. Uh, coffee contain, coffee in itself is a sap. It was supposed to protect the plant from predation. But so is cocoa, chocolate. Chocolate contains sap. It's a classical sap. I would say from all the, what they call recreational drink, coffee, chocolate, and green tea, all of them are sap. I mean, that you can abuse this. Have coffee with sugar, you're losing it, okay? And the same with chocolate. And the same with green tea. But if you take it right, coffee is fantastic. It does exactly what exercise does to your body. It inhibits mTOR, it activates AMPK, it promotes fat burning, it is catabolic, and it increases fat burning. Classical stuff. Okay. Green tea will do the same. Right. But you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to overdo it because your body will receive it as a chronic stress and shut down or give up. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it makes, like, for me, I never had a taste for coffee um, until I started doing intermittent fasting. And then I started to love coffee when I'd have it in the morning, uh, black coffee. Uh, but then eventually I started drinking coffee after meals, and then I didn't like it so much. No. It, it, it kind of affects you differently. On a it's kind of effective. Yeah. It's kind of, your meal, look. Craig, recently there was a research, very interesting, I mean, we can talk forever, but there was a research about the impact of extreme fasting on the body. They did it actually on animals. And they put animals on extreme fasting of 48 hours, which had some big downfalls to it. However, the, it caused very interesting supercompensation mechanism to take place. And what scientists found that during the supercompensation, that means they're refeeding, that's where your body benefits most. Not just the stress response and the fat burning and the autophagocytosis, the cleansing and the destruction of or any negative element. Yes, your body search and destroy even sick cells and tumor when you do that. And if you don't give it a chance, you get a higher chance to get cancer or tumor. So it's not just that. The red feeding with a super compensation mechanism now bring back super repair done by IGF-1, uh, which is uh, basically a mediator of growth hormone. Uh, tissues are built better. Uh, insulin is very sensitive. So whatever the, you eat translate to the right way even if you eat carbohydrates, you understand, um, your body has a great ability to deal with this. The empty glycogen reserve is an advantage. You will never gain fat even if you shove a lot of calories inside. Yes, you still don't want to shove sugar or refined carb, but your body ability to be nourished and utilize nutrient and energy is quadruple, more than quadruple, maybe a hundred times higher. So, when you recuperate, this is the wrong time to put coffee. 
It just doesn't make sense. Cough is supposed to affect your exercise. Are you eating and exercising at the same time? It's oxymoron. It right. doesn't make sense. The only thing you can put in your mouth is stress response compound during, before, and after exercise. Like we produce this special cocoa trouble, cacao. No fat, no sugar. They're sweetened in a different way. They're very tasty. You can put it in your mouth. It will enhance what exercise does because it's soft. If green pea is percolating coffee in your system when you exercise, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing after exercise. It's elongate the effect of exercise. But when you decide to recuperate and eat, do not put coffee that will antagonize. Right, okay, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And that doesn't even feel well with this. No. No, I, I never really understood that. And you know, it, it that's to the point. It's like um, when you're starting to drink coffee throughout the entire day, it, that's when it will take more from you than it will give you. Same thing if you're alcohol like abusing every night, of course correct. it's not a, a good thing. Um, Everything needs to be cycled, correct. Okay. Gotcha. And so um, are you still a proponent of really overeating in the evening and, uh, you know, really f eating a lot in the evening and, and limiting kind of um, food consumption during the day? Or how has is, how is your kind of thoughts around eating um, shifted over the years? That's one of the biggest, I think, uh, I'm glad you asked me that because that's one of the biggest problem I'm facing, yes, I use this term overeating, but what I meant is a relative term. Overeating, well, we were told at a time that we need to uh, restrict our food, count the calories. I remember the six meals a day, 300 calories per meal or something, you know, or the four meals a day, 500. I don't think that humans are even designed to think in the term of calorie counting. Yes, you can count overall calories per day, but I still don't believe that this is the right way to do things. So when I say overeating after undereating, I meant just go and eat to your heart. Don't think about it. Don't sh but do not ever, and I said it in my book, do not ever force feed yourself under any circumstances. Do not ever force feed yourself. Listen to your instinct. Eat as much as you want from the food that your body needs primarily most. What is primarily most? Vegetable, protein, and perhaps if you want to use certain kind of fat, it needs most. So you're not really limited. Where you are restricted is the food combination. It's very, very important to not jeopardize your diet with the wrong food combination. Like fat and carbohydrate do not mix together. You've got to choose your primary fuel. Mm. When you look at the human biology and other mammals, there is a clear contradiction between fat and carbohydrate. As your body shifts into fat fueling, your muscle cannot utilize the, the enzyme uh, that utilize carbohydrate are inhibited in the muscle and vice versa. When you load your body with carbohydrate, do not show a lot of fat as a primal fuel because it will cause deposit of fat in your fat cells and inflammatory process. So the way your diet have really clear rules of food combination, uh, you don't have to be extremely crazy about this uh, or too restricted. For instance, if you eat carb, you have a little bit olive oil on the top, that's fine. But don't put two primary fuel and shove it to your body at the same time. And that's like the that's like the American or like the modern approach to eating is heavy amounts of fats and carbs and sugar all combined because it maximizes your, your taste buds. It is the worst. In fact, the combination of fat and sugar now scientists know it's the most addictive, adverse, detrimental co combination. It binds the same receptor of crack cocaine and make you addicted. That's why you get addicted to the typical chocolate, not you personally, you know. 
but it's the most detrimental combination that we could do. In fact, there's nothing in nature, nothing that can combine high fat and high sugar together. Nothing. Show me a plant that does it, I'm resting my case. It doesn't. It doesn't. Not high fat and high sugar. It does not work and we never evolved to utilize it that way. Right. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, and actually, I want to. So I want to ask you. So, um, if you're, you know, doing fasting, exercising during the day, um, you mentioned not to have carbohydrates um, because that will increase insulin. And if you're having carbohydrates, yes, uh, you're gonna re uh, too often you're gonna reduce your insulin sensitivity, which is very important in in health and life extension is becoming more insulin sensitive. Um, so I want to ask you: Is it like? Uh, would you be? Would it be okay having like berries and and fruits of that nature? Would that be absolutely, absolutely? Because of the same reason we just discussed, Greg. Because berries, for instance, or wild type fruits, including papayas, mangoes, hey, even wild type bananas, they have stuff inside that compensate and increase your insulin sensitivity. Blueberries. Are loaded and even grapes on the skin are loaded with resveratrol. They have other compounds, they have polyphenol. All polyphenols are soft. Mm -hmm. Polyphenol are soft. You know, some scientists call polyphenol anti nutrients. Why? Because they reduce, they inhibit protein utilization in your body. But we know how important polyphenol is. We were trained to believe that nutrition is based on essential nutrients means vitamins, antioxidants, minerals. Do you know that there is a Melton research that show that vitamins, especially antioxidant vitamin and antioxidant, do not encourage or promote longevity. Do not. In fact, too much antioxidant, like most people do, they take antioxidant peel, inhibit your stress response. Are you aware of that? Are you aware? that your cell need oxidative stress to get into stress response and when you put this mega dose of antioxidant you shut down your stress response I published a vitamin report with all the science behind yeah I, I heard something like that I think recent actually a year ago um, how yeah the, 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 new, the recent trend of taking tons of antioxidant supplements actually is counterproductive uh, but I never really looked into it deeply. We need to get only nutrient as in concentration they appear naturally in food. That's what we evolved to. There's a reason why exercise benefits you. It's increased oxidative stress. It's the increased concentration of free radical in your cell that triggers stress response and compensation. If you shut it down up front, it's like putting sugar in your system. It's counter-effective. But the industry is ruthless. It's bringing on over simplistic idea. We still believe that nutrition needs to be by the definition of RDA for vitamin, mineral, and antioxidant. But the truth is not that. Antioxidant benefit you only if it's coming from food and they are food based. If they are synthetically produced, they're extremely counter affected, similar to white sugar. Okay, interesting. Wow. Um, so, and so, and what, so how do you recommend, I mean, are there supplements that you do recommend, uh, natural-based supplements that you find are beneficial, um, or do you recommend staying away from yeah. I believe that there are a lot of herbal formulas that can be extremely beneficial simply because they extract soft nutrients that help you heal your body and prevent it from damaging or age-related, uh, prevent age-related deterioration as well. Uh, we actually produce a plant-based multivitamin and mineral, which is 100% based on soft nutrient and vitamin as naturally occurring in food. I think it's the only one. I'm not a big believer in yeast nutrition. That's a subject by itself. There are companies that produce uh, feed yeast, the B vitamin, and produce. I don't believe, I don't think human benefits so much 
from yeast nutrition, even though it's a very interesting source, I'm not cutting it out, but it shouldn't be a primary source of nutrient. It should be only a supplement. And uh, many people actually develop very fast allergy to uh, yeast. I also believe that some food, uh, we should either restrict it or just move it out of our diet. So I'm against soy. Uh, I, I, unless it's the bean itself, which is less bioactive, all soy processes uh, contain um, isoflavonoid that promote too much estrogen in the body. And estrogen, as you know, is not just feminizing hormone, it's a fast storage hormone. It's a pro-inflammatory hormone when in excess. So, and there are certain kind of, but otherwise, yes, I do believe in good herbs and I believe in plant-based multivitamins. I don't think we need to supplement much more. Saf, yes. We need to bring back this nutrient. Um, again, we currently just brought some of the most potent one, which is berberine, salicin, green tea. It appears in berberine alone, which is the king of Saf, but they also stress response complex, and uh, we even source a special green tea. I take it myself, and it's amazing, Craig, uh, before the studies are finished, I don't want to claim anything, but I can tell you from people who take it, including people that I know in my office, um, they experience fat loss and weight loss, impact even if they don't change the diet. So it's a very interesting phenomenon to already see that. In fact, with berberine, I already give it to my dogs. I had it in a turkey and I give it to my dogs because of the anti-cancerous research behind it. When you have time, go and check the research reference. It's very, they're very exciting. Yeah, no, I'm very curious in anything that can really boost health and, and, and uh, it's anti-cancerous. Um, I'm, uh, after this call, I'm definitely going to like dig into it and, and go check berberine out. Um, I might have to stop by at Whole Foods or something. Uh, that's, that's fascinating. It's hard to get them, that's the problem. Berberine do not appear alone. It's a new stuff that we are bringing back. It does appear in certain herbs like, I say, golden seal, astragalus, but in smoke, not very bioactive concentration. So I believe that we are perhaps the first people who brought over blood on your face in concentration that we believe are biological. Okay, and, and that's defense nutrition. That's where you... Um, have your, your different products and supplements? DefenseNutrition.com, correct. Okay, cool. And so I guess, you know, the, the, the last thing that I kind of want to talk about, which um, I really noticed when I first started immersing myself in, you know, the, the concepts of the warrior diet around, you know, fasting and under eating during the day and, and really feeding at, at night is this whole idea of the sim sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is funny because for so long, we hear people say, you know, eat, eat big for breakfast and then, you know, start cutting back on food at night, and that just contradicts what our biology wants. Um, and, and so let's kind of touch base upon um, how under-eating kind of stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, which kind of keeps you alert, focused, and energetic. Uh, yeah, it's funny because years ago I wrote a blog, it's called the Top 10 Diet Fallacies, when I really address your question. Oh. Uh, but I, I, I don't think I can say it better do, than you did just now. Yeah, uh, the sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system, uh, uh, contradict themselves. And you don't want them to clash with each other. So, um, um, during the day, during the day you want to wanna sympathetic nervous system. Under eating of fasting, under eating and exercising, and during the night you encourage the, the parasympathetic place, place where you basically eat your meal and relax and go to sleep. And go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Violating violating can really mess up. Can really mess up. Right. I um, think your mic was cutting out a little bit, but yeah, I think I heard the gist of that. 
Um, and it's it's funny because it's it's once I once I started uh, uh, following that whole approach of like okay you know saving most of my food and and calories for later in the day all of a sudden eating healthier was so much easier I didn't have the cravings I slept way better at night and I was I was able to work a lot more productively during the day which is just huge benefit so it's like I mean you, know, you hear people read about like this diet and that diet it's like well the whole concept around the warrior diet is something that I actually have never had any impulse to change. Um, I've always kind of kept it in place. Um, it's just the one thing that's like, this makes complete sense and this feels so good. And it gives, like, it's, it's like, it's effortless to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I I'm sorry, something is wrong with my microphone. Oh, it, it seems to be working now. It seems to be working now. It does? It does? Yeah, yeah. I feel I I do. I do. <laughs> Actually, so, I think it just gets so, it gets it, it softens out a bit, but yeah. I um. But Craig, but Craig, um, um, why would why you would you change something that works for you? It's like I wrote I wrote that people never had sex. Why would they stop? Why would they stop? Shoot, you know what? I'm I'm <laughs> you, the mic's getting cutting out at the end. Um, I'm losing at the end. It's, shoot, I'm not sure what's happen what's going on there. But I can hear you for the first half, and then it just kind of fizzles out. Uh, but no, exactly. Like, why would you change something that works so well? Um, you wouldn't, you know. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, well, here let's let's wrap up. We covered some. Really important topics, and 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 uh, I guess after this after this podcast, it's very crystal clear and evident that you know what we're actually designed to function better with stress. That's why diet, that's why exercise is good for us, and you know intermittent fasting has such uh, profound benefits. And and so I guess the next step to take it to the next level is to experiment with um, these uh, SAF compounds, stress activated food. Um, which has long been almost removed from our diet in large part. Um, very, uh, very interesting stuff, and and it's also important, I guess, to optimize insulin sensitivity by you know restricting carbohydrates for a good portion of the day, as opposed to eating you know uh, starchy carbs every three hours. Um, and and so I mean, yeah, these are some really cool, amazing points. Are there anything, anything else that you want to kind of wrap up with before we, before we end the call? No, besides no, the fact that you can provide information, and I'm planning to bring you the radio talk show by the end of the year, beginning of the year. We will keep, we will keep providing information. information. Regarding how to do how to move both in theories, theories practice. practice. And there is much more. Is much more. I, apologize I apologize for the microphone. microphone. You know, it's okay. It was working for like pretty much the whole thing, so it's not a big issue. And so, for everyone that wants to kind of take a look and immerse themselves in Ori's work, he's at defensenutrition.com. That's where he posts articles and he has some of his, his work. And um, and some of his uh, um, supplements and 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 stuff of that nature. So I mean, you guys can check it, uh, this out. I mean, Ori is very much ahead of the curve um, as far as all these things go. He was talking about fasting long before, almost a decade before anyone else started talking about it. And uh, I, I imagine that what you're talking about now is going to probably pick up in another five, ten years. Thank you, Craig. I really appreciate you. I really, I really appreciate it. It was great. Thank you so much for coming on. All right, guys. Thank you for listening to uh, the Road Trip Podcast. You can go check out Ori at DefenseNutrition.com, and we will put all the details in the show notes at KinoBody.com. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.